What's up, everybody? This is Scott from We Coulda Done Porn, back with episode 42. Guys, we've done it. We found the answer to life, love, and everything. And without further ado, cue theme music. So, buddy... We're back again. It's been another week. I uh, I got to go to sleep for a change. I, I got like a good amount of sleep. I, I, I didn't stay up till like 9 a.m. and then take a nap for two hours and wake up. So I'm feeling like ready to go. How you feeling? How you doing? You know, I've also been catching up on sleep since the uh, since the video came out last week. I think I've been my body has been uh, trying to catch up on the lost sleep from that week. Um, I think it went to a, a period of extreme stress, and then it was just all gone. So I was like, okay, we can sleep. Ah, oh, man. I, I, I feel that 110%. Like, I uh, I don't know. I, I, I realized last week before we did the podcast, and uh, it really hit me this, this t- Tuesday when, you know, before I was saying, like, oh, we can do a Friday through Tuesday, like, stream schedule. Oh, I can do that, and I, I got to Tuesday, and I was like, no, I can't. I was like, that literally leaves me with... Uh, no single like night of not doing something um and i was like all right so that that tuesday will have to be in and not like a one-off because we wanted to play kingdom hearts and i'm sure there'll be tuesdays going forward where it's like hey this game is launching we're all excited let's get in but tuesday is going to be a maybe day like if, if everything's going great and the week is super chill and we really want to we'll stream on tuesdays but for the most part, we're going to stick with Monday, th- uh, Friday through Monday for now. Because, uh, dude, Tuesday rolled around and I got home and it, like, I walked through my front door and, you know, when you just, you feel that, like, weight hit your shoulders and you just kind of, sl- you can't pick up your feet so you just shuffle. I did one of those. <laughs> I was talking to Sage on the phone and he was like, then go to bed. <laughs> I was like, okay. That seems like great life advice, Scott. Please go to bed. <laughs> go the fuck to sleep. So yeah, that's what I did. And uh, I woke up the next day feeling a lot better. And then, you know, uh, I I had my regular Wednesday-like thing. And then my Thursday game canceled for the umpteenth time. Because I'm pretty sure most of my players have just abandoned me. Mad at all of you. Uh, and... Uh, so last night I got home and I just, I sat down and I relaxed and I played a new video game, but I guess we'll talk about that in the newsstand. Cool. Uh, Sounds good. Yeah. So, uh, what about you? How have you been like catching up on sleep? I know you you just said that you had been, but like, really that's it. I just sleep in a little longer than I normally do. And I, I continue my day as normal. I go to the gym, go to work. Um, try and catch up on reading because right now I'm doing a lot of research for my next upcoming episode. Really, I've been trying to get into a, a kind of, um, because this is my only my second attempt for this video series and also it's a shorter month than normal, I'm trying to find a uh, um, rhythm. Yeah, a rhythm, a routine, like how I'm going to spend my first week, how I'm going to spend the week after that. Really, what I've learned is that the first week is probably all just going to be reading and research, Mm -hmm. Um, especially when it's about topics I'm not as intimately familiar with. Uh, In the case of the Jurassic World video, I remember it was like a whole month's worth of research. It was Mm -hmm. just me pulling up random stuff and being like, oh, and then it would lead me to some other rabbit hole. Um... And I'm realizing, like, I don't have the time to do that, really. Uh, So I'm trying to figure out, like, what sources are going to be best, um, like, how I'm going to streamline the process of doing that kind of research. Uh, It's kind of a bummer because I would like to cite stuff like books and various authors and things like that, but I just don't have the time. So I'm mainly using, like, studies and articles, uh, which isn't a bad thing as long as I could say that there is some reference to what I'm talking about. Um... And also doing better research. That's kind of been a hard thing to do as well. Like, I want to make sure that I'm I'm getting legitimate, legitimate sources. Um, I don't want to be quoting articles that, like, I don't trust or that an, I, a normal audience wouldn't trust. 
so like this week, Aaron uh, asked me uh, for the first time. He's like, "Hey, do you are you do, you you do one of these overthinking at some point?" And I was like, "I guess probably." And uh, I'm gonna get all of my information from uh, Reddit, Nine Gag, <laughs> and The Onion. That sounds perfectly reasonable. <laughs> You know, just uh, post just post on Reddit, like, what do you think of this? And, <laughs> like, just uh, take all of it, like, all the good and the bad, and just form that into a thesis of some sort. By the way, you sent me a Winnie the Pooh <laughs> gift, and now I legitimately have a Winnie the Pooh overthinking it in the works. That's so good. That makes um, me very happy. That's quite a bit down the line, but uh, it'll be an interesting episode. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I've, I've been racking my brain on what I could do, uh, like, specifically, and so I'll, 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 the wheels are spinning. Well, the good news is, is I have about eight months' worth of content now. Bitchin'. Um, I really didn't think that it would all come to me that easily, um, but because I have such a broad range of things I could talk about, because I won't just be talking about movies, makes it a little easier. Yeah, I feel that. I uh, I guess as far as like the other housekeeping stuff goes, um, our Patreon is live. You can you can find us now at uh, patreon.com slash Roman Bear Productions. It's very long. <laughs> or no, it's just Roman Bear because it wouldn't let me have the productions. So it's oh, really? patreon.com slash Roman Bear, which is better because having the full productions thing would be very long. Uh, yeah, but please. yeah, you can, if you uh, if you like what you see, you guys know the deal. You can go over there, toss us the dollar. I think it's worth a dollar. Yeah, um, and honestly, most of it will just go back into supporting our our project uh, because it is basically everything we do is off off the clock. Um, yeah, the, the, yeah, I think that's like goal one for the first like for the the rest of this financial year is us getting uh, all of the different cool things we do to basically just pay for themselves so we can make more stuff for you guys. Uh, and so that's cool. Also, I would love, uh, to give another shout out to, uh, Rick Orange, our, uh, artist extraordinaire who I, I have messaged about 60 times this week with more ideas and more things. And I keep bothering him like every other day. It's like, Hey Rick, but what if we did this instead of the last three things I told you to do? Could you just stop that and do this? That's the, uh, uh <laughs> that's the basic life of a graphic designer. Yeah. <laughs> hey, I know I said do this, and we've already emailed back and forth about 50 times with the minimal changes, but actually, I'm thinking we start back from scratch. <laughs> yeah, uh, like We're literally... We're thinking a uh, porcupine now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think literally, my, my last one was, I, I like, the first idea I'd sent him for emotes was something along the lines of, like, a chariot riding bear, and it would say, like, hype on the chariot. And I was like, that would be really cool. That and would then be. I realized that, like, it's probably too small. And I was like, how about, I think Aaron suggested this, uh, the, the fat bear in a chair yes, eating grapes. The, uh, I, like, what do you even call that? The gluttonous uh, yep. aristocrat. I, yep. I, I wouldn't even know how to. There's, there's probably a term for that specific portrayal of wealth, <laughs> but I don't know what it is. I don't know. I t- I'm just going to call him Dionysus Bear. Even though it's Greek, <laughs> I well, I'm thinking of my my inspiration from that is mainly coming from Futurama, the the golden robot character who's always oh, on yeah. a chase, just always eating grapes and being unnecessarily sexual. Yep. Oh my! Yeah, no, I, I, he's he's adorable. He's uh, he's the the like uh, tier two emote on twitch if anybody knows what that means the bear uh, not the future on my character yeah the bear <laughs> <laughs> so uh yeah just another shout out to rick orange our, our fantastic artist who we just keep uh putting through his paces <laughs> yeah we'll try not to uh i think we're trying to strike a balance between you know letting people know that like they can support more videos if they like them and more stuff if they like them uh and begging for money which it always inevitably comes across as like, yeah, your money, please. Yeah. It's a thing I, I think we're both like, I, I've been trying to be really conscious of as we go forward. Cause honestly, like the only thing I give a damn about is being able to make more stuff. Cause it's fun. I like doing it. Yeah. If, if people think it's worth a dollar fucking legit, like we love that dollar because we love you. Uh, and yeah, I, I don't know. I, I think that's everything housekeeping-wise. There's not a whole 
Elle's lot. Th- like everything that that would normally be housekeeping is starting to bleed into achievements right now because we're still getting things set up and learning the like how to do this. Yeah. Uh, I was I was actually having a a very like brief conversation on a Discord channel today about how that first year of doing anything is definitely the hardest mm-hmm. because. Uh, Maybe not even a year. Maybe the first, like, three to six months is the hardest. Because that's when you're trying to get it to fit into, like, your life schedule. You're trying to find that routine. You're trying to figure out, like, all right, uh, well, if I do it this way, does it work better than doing it that way? And, like, we did that a bunch with the podcast. And, like, the podcast only now. Like, I think really, like, Christmas time is when, like, just a month and a half ago is when it finally went to, like, autopilot mode fully. Where it's like, no, we just do this. Fridays, sit down, record, done, move along. Oh, um, I guess we can mention that our podcast is now available, will now be available to listen to on YouTube as well, if you want to do that. Uh, It took, it took like three days for it to process, so I have to condense those videos. I I think I, like... Did you export it the wrong way or something? Well, yeah, I think so. I think I, well, I just did it through After Effects, and I think the After Effects... Like, the way I exported it was too large, mm-hmm. um, and it just took forever to process, so it didn't come out on Monday like I had originally hoped. It just popped yep. up on Thursday, like, it's done processing. I was like, oh, shit, because <laughs> um, I forgot about it. Yep. So uh, I'm going to have to start coming up with some thumbnails for those, too. I don't want them all to look exactly the same. We need some clickbait-style well, that, the thumbnails. Thing. We, we, we can't control <laughs> thumbnails until yeah, we you have can. a few hundred subscribers. No, you can you get three that they select for you. No, no, no. I'm saying uh, for overthinking it, I made my own thumbnail. Oh, did we hit the mark I, for thumbnails? Well, I, I guess. guess. It let me okay, do cool. my own personal one. Awesome. And that was before hit. overthinking it came out. So I think you you automatically have control. Well, weren't you saying that like YouTube has a thing where you just need to... Um, That's true. Yeah, I did that just might have, have to like literally might, verify our email. And that might have been a bunch it. of stuff. That <laughs> might that might have been the whole thing. Uh, I'm just a silly boy and don't actually know how to YouTube. Me neither. Uh, to learning. be honest, I'm still learning as well. That, but I guess with that we can move into achievement unlock with some stuff that maybe we have learned. Hell yeah! Pew 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 pew. pew. So, uh, achievements this week. Uh, Aaron, you want to take it away first, my dude? Sure. Um, what do you got? Well, as far as, like, I've been doing a a good amount of research, reading some books. Um, I'm going to sit down with all my Calvin and Hobbes tomorrow and just kind of... I'm just going to read it like I used to read them. I'm just going to flip through and enjoy. that you have those. I wanted those so bad. I would love, actually, like, as much of, like, heresy as this may sound, I would adore having a digital collection of all of Calvin and Hobbes. Your brother has all of my Calvin and Hobbes books. Oh, he does! Oh, he I'll does. Get them back. Um, and I I'll have. Keep them. I'm I'm lucky enough for Nina's um, Nina's parents to have bought me the the um, I don't know if it was an anniversary edition, but it's basically everything compiled into three books, and it's very mm-hmm. nice, like very minimalist design. It's it's beautiful. It's absolutely gorgeous. Um, and so I have that, and also I'm going to be buying a book, uh, an ebook for. There's a book called Let's Go Exploring, mm-hmm. Calvin and Hobbes, and it's uh, like a, a, a very rare extended interview with Bill Watterson and a, a book about his process and like the art, like his kind of, st- it's, it's nice. It looks like a little, basically a documentary book. And I'm, cool. I'm uh, very, very interested in that. So I'm going to purchase that and give it a look-see because I've it's just something of Calvin and Hobbes that I don't have, and I've always been interested in um, how Bill yeah. Watterson goes about doing his artwork. Yeah, I didn't realize he was as, like, secretive and, like, to himself as he is. He is, uh, and he's that, that way with everything. Yeah, there's a documentary on him uh, that, that is, uh, I there's, think, still on Hulu and Netflix. There's there's two. The one I think you're talking about is Dear Mr. Watterson. Yes, that is the one that I is know. That is a very cute one. Uh, it's, it's very nice. It's less about him and, and seemingly more about people's uh reaction to calvin and Hobbes and their their uh their love of yeah, it. it is the the impact it has had and how it is carried forth in, and in the a, generations and how i'm gonna ruin that with my next video no i'm just kidding <laughs> i won't i won't I think do that Aaron would make himself cry if he did that i absolutely would um 
and there will probably be parts in the video where I'm like, oh no, how did we get here? I, I just want to talk. I just want to love Calvin and Hobbes. But Captain Christian already has a video that's way better than mine would ever be about that. So, um, that's fun. <laughs> which is a po- very great YouTube channel if you've never checked out Captain Christian with two Ks. Uh, is it's really good stuff. Uh, anyway, so but my achievement, my like official achievement, uh, is that the the video has been out for about a week. My official achievement is that we have some haters. Oh yeah, dude, it's so good. Okay, so so here's the thing. Um when Scott messaged me, like I think we got under somebody's skin. Uh I had already looked so I woke up, I went to the gym, and mm-hmm. while I was at the gym, uh as people do, I checked my YouTube account. Uh and I was like, "Whoa, four new uh comments." And comments really excite me because I I want to see what people think. Uh, for the most part, it was just comments like really good stuff, a little bit long, but really good stuff. Like a lot of validating comments. I was like, oh, yeah, thank you. Um, <laughs> and so I saw four and I was like, yay, people are engaging. And it was all the same guy. And I was like, oh, no, come on. And then I started reading them. And at first I was like, okay, <laughs> what? what what and as i got further so i figured out the reason there's five different comments from this guy he there's only one explanation for it because of the way they're structured they're structured by part yeah he he was definitely going like stream of consciousness like as he watched the video he paused the video and was just like i got stuff to say and so (laughs) here's the thing um I actually, I want to thank this person because they watched the whole video. That's that's great. Like, I know some people probably watch some of it and then just react to whatever their first thing is and dislike or like. Uh, so, um, thank you for watching the whole video if you happen to be listening to this podcast. Um, but, uh, like, and, and there were a few valid points I felt. Like, he brought up good points. I, I'd like to read them, read some of them. <laughs> on the on this channel oh, um but God. here i'm gonna read the one this is not by that person this is an actual hater and uh, is this the one we got like yesterday yeah yeah yes this is my yeah, favorite yeah. one um this person put you had me until you went to toxic masculinity you loser oh and Thank you <laughs> I'm just like what, what this you means are, is that ma- they made it about sixty percent into the video, and that's all we that, like. Thank and you. then just went no, <laughs> and was like everything else was right, and then you started talking about this, and therefore everything else must be bad. Yep. It's like what a weird way to live life, where you get to a point where it's like this is something that usually is contentious, and then you just stop listening altogether. Yep. It's like, okay, if I've had you up until this point, why are you deciding that now is obviously the time I'm wrong? Yep. Um, that was an interesting one. Also, ironic a little bit. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't know why he had to call me a loser, but oh, yeah, you, you got me. <laughs> oh, my feelings. Oh, oh. oh that was the oh. magic word. Now I'm going to crumble like a small child. But uh, I don't know. So, like, I, I real I've realized lately that I am like, I I've gotten weird over the years. Uh, where Scott like, was I, giddy. I have been. I, I've hit this point where I'm just so excited anytime anybody like comes and checks out our stuff, like good, bad, otherwise. I don't care. Like, I'm just glad that like you were willing to take minutes out of your day. And watch yeah. something that like one of us made, and I'm like, fucking good on you, man. You're the best. Yeah, and, like, this person wrote quite a bit. Um, and that's why, I, like, I, I genuinely appreciate that it wasn't, like, just, like, straight up, like, you suck, LOL. It was yeah. literally, like, hey, they these t- are, like, my points. I disagree with you vehemently. Okay, have a good day. <laughs> uh, well, towards the end, it seemed to get a little bit aggressive, but, like, it still didn't feel too bad. Like, it, it wasn't, like, you loser. <laughs> it was generally just, like, no, there were, like I really a, don't a, agree actual, with these points. like, attempted, at, like, points they, I, they articulated that's, themselves that's the thing they were attempted 
Um, so a few of these. These are the. This is the person that put like five comments. Uh, one of his comments says the VFX artist market is saturated. That means that if you're in the market, get out and do something else. Demand is high and supply has outstripped it. If supply hasn't outstripped it, then they'd get more pay. That seems like a kind of a uh, shitty way of looking at it. Like my point of bringing up the the role of VFX artists is to talk about the fact that they're being treated poorly. There's enough money to go around. That's not the problem. And just because a market is saturated with people, like, there's enough jobs for them, clearly. As I mentioned, mm -hmm. Avengers had, like, nine VFX houses working on it. Yeah. Um, the problem isn't that there's a lack of jobs and that there's too many people. The problem is they're not being treated fairly. They're not being treated like equal partners on this movie. They're not being treated like the electric department or the actors or the... Or the the screenwriters who all have unions, yeah, uh, all of and, which and are safety also nets. oversaturated markets. Yeah, but like they they have like layers of protection to make sure, like when you do right. break into the market, that you get a fair shake. Um, like right. if if we we got unionized and like I went to a set as a PA, there's a set like minimum that they have to pay me based on what like their set budget is. And it just makes sure that, like, you have food on the table. Right. The VFX it, doesn't have that as much because it is the newest out of all the film industries. Right. And also, it, it's, um, like, the studios know this. The governments know this. It's it's just that nobody has stood up for themselves long enough. Like, that VFX strike dissolved and nothing was solved. And, um, like, I never said it was about money. In fact... A VFX artist can make really good money. The problem is that they have to work long and extreme hours to make that kind of money. And it's it it it's, it takes a huge toll, like with what I mentioned about substance abuse and and these people not being able to have a life or a family outside of their work. And that, that's, goes, that's a problem. Yeah, it goes back to crunch culture, which is a big thing that's being dealt with in the video game industry right now because it's a similar field of you're spending... Yeah, hours upon hours sitting in front of a computer building digital assets, which is a very, like, tedious and, like, detailed and painstaking bit of work. Yeah. And because of that, that's why you end up with, like, when crunch time hits and it's like, this is the deadline, you gotta do it, you spend, you know... Aaron did it literally last week where he, he pulled that, like, 36-hour day because he had to get the content up and out and make it himself. And that happens all the time in the VFX industry and the games industry and a lot of other, like, technology-based stuff. And it, it's... Not that, like, I'm not a person that thinks, like, crunch is the worst thing. No, no. I, I, my thing is always, like, if you're crunching and there's no compensation, then it's bad. Right. Well, it, like, if you're doing it for yourself, which most of these people are, like, it's a labor of love, as he makes a point in another criticism to make, ironically, it's a labor of love. These people are there because that's what they want to do badly. They love it. Um, and I make sure to point that out in the video. Uh, but... The industry is encouraging the type of behavior that continues to perpetuate them having to work those ridiculously long hours and stuff like that. It'd be one mm -hmm. thing if the industry was like, these guys work hard. We need to make sure that there's things in place to make sure that they don't have to work ridiculously hard. But instead they go, hey, these guys love it so much. We'll let them do whatever they want, but we don't have to pay them for it. Like, we're going to be hands off in that respect. Um, so that was one. I'm going to get, like, I, I just, there's one more that I've really, like. Uh, you get one more. Oh, my God. I really want to do two. Then it's my turn. Oh, yeah, okay. Um, this one was really weird. Oh, God. I really want to go through three of these. All right. So the U.S. Aaron's is, really excited be, that people are engaging. Yeah. And I, like, this is my chance to respond because I don't want to do it through YouTube. I, I don't want to, like, start, uh, being the guy that's like hanging out on the comments, like, no, I have to prove you wrong. Um, but like, I figured that I could just talk about it on the podcast because this is more free form. Um, all right. So, so this is the quote. All right. So the U S military does this thing where it pays people in honor and glory rather than money. What? Okay. Moving past that. Those who don't like that deal work as military contractors and they insist on being paid in money and accept that they'll be seen as dogs of war. The branding efforts are part of a calculation by the enterprise that it's cheaper to enhance the brand and pay people in honor and glory than to convince people to sign up with money. Similarly, VFX artists are often there for the honor and glory despite the poor pay and bad working conditions. Um, with the military, paying people would 
pe- paying people more would mean higher taxes. So in another sense, you should be asking if you would pay rather pay for your safety in the form of honor and glory or pay for safety with money. Um, I, I think I made this very clear. I don't think the military is an evil cabal, as he says later, like that I need to not think about it that way. I don't. Um, but I do, yeah, recogni- I, I, I do he, recognize when somebody is being taken advantage of, and in this case, young impressionable people are being taken advantage of by the narrative. And where is the money thing coming from? I never once, once mentioned pay being a problem in the military. They get paid fine. Uh, the yeah, prob- like my, my, the, he doesn't engage with the problems I do point out, like sexual assault. Um, higher rates of suicide. The Marine Corps just had their highest rate of suicide this last year. That's insane. With the amount of money being poured into the military, we can't we can't protect these people out of the service. Homelessness when they get out. Like I pointed out all these problems because there are problems that aren't talked about, and it seems misleading and um and not insidious, but a little a little wrong not to frame the military without having some of these things in mind. Like, I get why you wouldn't, but these people are young and impressionable, as most people are. It's just like product placement. We don't think it works, but it absolutely does, and they know it. Like, they're pushing a narrative about our glory, and, like, especially, as I mentioned in Michael Bay films, there's just, like, nothing ever wrong with the military. The military is the best. And that's simply not true. Like, it's dangerous to push that kind of narrative without having a little bit of, like, just some sort of disclaimer, which they don't yeah, that, really... Yeah, like, everything has, like, troubles. And, like, that. I, th- I think you did a pretty good job of illustrating. But this is... It's funny, because this is actually... If, if anybody, like, ever takes debate classes or learns, like, how to debate, this is one style of argument is to, like, pick specific things in somebody's, like, really full argument and try and pull a string... And yeah. see if that makes the person unravel. And that's kind of what this person did. So I give him props for attempting, but he's, you're still he's ignoring bad at 90% it. of the argument. Yeah, you know, he's he basically he ignores all the points I do make to make his own. Um like that's what it seems like. He's like a lot of it a lot of the comments were like uh you made these arguments, but you didn't make this one. Uh, and like, especially with the military, I don't know where he got the whole money thing and like paying people in honor and glory. Like, what are you talking about? That's not the, the <laughs> pay them in well, honor uh, and glory. You can ask them if they give a shit. Um, but I, I guess like in, in like summing this up, like what is your achievement that like the, the videos like actually it's doing well. It's, I love that it's garnering attention and it's having people engage. Um, so if you're listening to this podcast the person who commented five times, Colin, um, I want you to know that this is not a personal attack, um, that I am engaging back with you in the only way that I feel free to do so. Um, also your race thing is bullshit. Like (laughs) there's all the background characters are diverse. Like that's your quota for diversity. Like the, that was the whole point. I mentioned that there's diversity in the background. The point is that the f- stories focus on only white characters most of the time. Did you miss <laughs> that part? Is your, like, idea of diversity having enough black people in the background? Like, did we have enough black extras? Okay, we're fine then. That's diversity, guys. Da-dun, I mean, that's da-dun, how da-dun, I measure diversity on the podcast itself. Yeah, he's like, uh... <laughs> <laughs> he said that... He said that the the woman that was a part of, like, the woman and the Asian dude that were a part of the team that go to try and kill the Indominus Rex and it, like, kills them. Yeah. He's like, oh, the casual disregard of their deaths is is real progress because it's treated with the same as the men's. And I'm like, you got a weird sense of progress, man. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay. Anyway, uh, I guess on a, on a different side of the spectrum, um, as far as going with my achievements, uh, I... I have finally figured out, I think, all of how my computer works now. And by that I mean, when I installed all the gear and all the stuff for the, the capture card and all this other nonsense to stream, I, it changes a bunch of your background settings. And I just figured out how to do all of that and how to control it all. 
Uh, we, we have a Discord channel now for Roman Bear, so we're set up. If you guys want to join the Discord, Discord, just hit us up on, like, Twitter or on Twitch or on any of the other social media platforms, and we'll uh, drop you a link. We will DM you one. Uh, well, if you, you can also, if you, like, pop in on Twitch during streams, you'll see it pop up every now and then. Uh, besides that, I got our info page set up on Twitch. That's pretty much good. The Patreon is uh, live and running. It, we're not pushing it too crazy yet because it's missing one art asset and I'm a perfectionist and it bothers me that it's not there. Uh, but it'll be there by the end of the weekend, so by the time you guys hear this, it's live and it's in there. <laughs> uh, uh, other things that I got done, so the info thing, uh, and, and my last thing, and this is my favorite thing, just because I'm a child and I've been personally mourning the fact that I can't do this, uh, for Christmas, I believe I mentioned, my brother bought me a very, very nice headset to use when gaming, but because I was streaming, I didn't, like, I didn't think I could use it, because I have to, like, pass all my audio through my computer, and it's a big pain in the butt, but I, I found out today, because I'm a silly boy and didn't read the box, and I remember now, because this is why I bought this headset, is it works on all consoles. And PC. So all I had to do was plug the little USB dongle into my PC and turn on the headset. And so I now have a wireless headset hooked up to my PC, and it's so much more comfortable. So at the end of, like, long five, six-hour streams, my ears will no longer hurt, and it's great, and I'm, I love it. It's the best day ever. <laughs> Scott's happy. I'm happy. Okay, Colin, hold on. One last point, Colin. <laughs> what are you talking Somebody about? Bring, no, no, hold on. Wait, no, bring, wait, bring the newsstand. Wait, no, wait. You don't get to go to the newsstand out on my watch. I edit the videos. Uh, what are you talking about with the military being paid more? Taxes go up. The military got a seven hundred or got a $150 billion boost and taxes were cut. What are you talking about? <laughs> Let's go to the newsstand. Extra, extra, read all about it. So, uh, now that we're in the newsstand here, uh, Aaron, uh, I feel like I always take the newsstand first, and I, we're tossing it to you first a lot today. What, 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 what do you got? What's your all, thing? All I've really done, and this is really sad to me because, um, up, ramping up to oh, the first episode over, thinking it, my life was mostly consuming media, and mm. now it's the opposite. Now I'm just constantly working to try and, uh, put stuff out there. Uh, like, literally, I got Kingdom Hearts 3... Um, only a day after it came out and I've only, I've only made it just past. T I was you so started Kingdom Hearts 2.9. <laughs> I, I finished Kingdom Hearts 2.9. I was so <laughs> pissed off. I was like, what? <laughs> what the fuck? It's the oh. best troll moment in all of is like, that, the video Is that games. what you were referring to last? Yes. Uh, was that the small moment? Yep. I, I thought the like, small no moment. Dick. Okay, so what I thought you were talking about is the for those of you, this is I guess a minor spoiler, but not really. Your first level in the game is Hercules, and I guess all of that part counts as Kingdom Hearts two point nine. Yep. When you get to the level, um, they're like, "Where's the fanfare?" <laughs> and I was like, "Wait, my mind shattered <laughs> into a million pieces." They can hear the theme music? <laughs> That's the, the when you go to the Colosseum level, there's always a fanfare playing. Yep. And there's no... It's not coming from anywhere. This means that in-universe, canon, Sora, Donald, and Goofy can hear the music that you're hearing during the entire thing. It's all part of Donald's magic. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so playing a little bit of Kingdom Hearts 3, uh, is my big thing. Um, I like it and I don't. There's a lot of both for me. Um, I very much dislike the attractions. I just don't. They're, they're so good and silly and overpowered. They're, they're, they are. That's what I mean. So, uh, one of my main contentions with Kingdom Hearts 2 is like the really ridiculous, like triangle activation moves and... It just felt like you didn't... In the first game, I felt challenged to learn how to fight well. When to block, when to roll. Like, I felt like it was a real challenge to be able to to fight through some situations. Um, in this game, or in Kingdom Hearts 2, it's like they took a lot of that out with the triangle moves that were 
they weren't as overpowered, but like they they took some of the fun out of it. Like I'm just hitting fucking triangle, man. Like that's not fun. Uh, I want to have to roll and dodge and dip dive <laughs> down. You five D's a dodgeball. Uh, and so in this one, the attractions are like an extension of that. They're just way overpowered and nonsensical and like they take up the whole thing and I'm just like, oh my God, what is happening? Um, like it's cute. It is cute. Like, it's like, okay, that's an interesting way to frame this is the old, old style attraction rides of like the original Disney. Um, but yeah, um, I'm not... I don't mind the triangle activation moves as much like Donald, Goofy, and Sora's like ability to work together to do certain things. It doesn't and bother all me those as much. Require like either you or them to be doing combos and hits. Yeah. Um, I also so one of the th- I don't know where this is going yet, Scott. You probably know because you've been I'm playing on for a the while. Last level. Okay. <laughs> uh, you can catch on fire. Right. Yep. Okay. So what I'm what I'm asking is. Um, does your ability to take damage, cha- like recover from damage, change throughout the game? Because when you catch on fire, you can't do anything. You're just fucking flailing around for like five, six whole seconds. And then uh, there are certain times when you get hit in the air where you're just falling. Yeah, so uh, the, the the falling thing is a skill that you, you might have forgotten because it's been a minute since you've played. But there is a move called Aerial Recovery. It's in all the Kingdom Hearts games. It's an unlockable mm. combat move. So that's how you save yourself from that. Okay. Um, the As far as like the, the elemental damages, uh, of course, as you go through the game, you will get items that you can equip to boost your elemental resistance, which decreases how likely it is for those elements to affect you. And some okay. will outright like negate them. So things like being set on fire, being like stunned by electricity or frozen by ice, uh, all of that stuff will change uh, based on your... your Condition, like yeah, because that got that got annoying quick. I was like, "What the hell?" Dodge. Um, it can be fun to. I kind of like the wall running stuff. That can be a lot of fun, but at the same time, the controls get uh, take a while to get used to. I, like, I pass just. I'm just like where I am at the game is just past where Kingdom Hearts three starts, and you're in tr- Traverse Town. Um, is it Traverse or Twilight? Twilight. Twilight Town. Sorry, Twilight Town, and you fight the giant horde of. Uh, heartless mm-hmm. like they're giant centipede heartless and it's yep. going through walls and stuff and I just like could not get to it half the time I was like what the shit I, it took me way too long to do it I think the music had to loop like it was like oh shit are you serious all right we gotta loop the music um uh, use the shot lock command <laughs> there's a lot of new stuff in this game uh like they do so, a lot what's cool is because like for those of us who, who are like super nerds and have played through all of them uh, it's uh, the only new things are the keyblade switching and the uh, the attractions. Everything else is actually built from things in Dream Drop Distance and Birth by Sleep. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, including the, the maps. What's that? Including like maps and like free free scope worlds. Well, I, I mean combat wise. Okay. Uh, so the the form changes came from Birth by Sleep, and then the um free flow motion the thing where you can like jump on walls and bounce back and forth and all that yeah all that came from dream drop oh really yep yeah it's a lot of like i think that's something that's a little more interesting to me because that seems like something you actually have to get good at because i'm not right now Mm -hmm. um especially like doing the whole column swings thing and i'm like what is the point i haven't hit anybody i try to do it so often i'm just like I'm gonna swing off yep. and hit somebody, and then I'm on the other side of the map. Yeah, like, I, I, oh, I did work on it a little bit because it's uh, at least with the setup I picked, it takes a long while before you start getting enough of the commands to really do the crazy stuff you could do in Dream Drop. Because in Dream Drop, it, the entire combat system was based on that. Okay, like you, you were supposed to constantly be in flow motion, uh, like to like do the really crazy stuff. And actually, like when you got flow motion down, you could never like if you wanted to, you could go through an entire level without hitting the ground. <laughs> Uh, it was crazy, but the whole game was designed around that concept. Uh, whereas this one, it's it's an extra feature of the combat system. But my only qualm with the game so far, like it, anybody who's jumping in with this one, don't like play. Like you have to play all the other ones because it makes no sense otherwise. It's silly. Yeah. yeah. Um, it is a PS2 game made with all the like silly and fun trappings of a PS4 game. 
It was just like, it has the exact same mentality as Kingdom Hearts 1 and 2 did as far as gameplay mechanics and everything, but they were just able to throw all of the modern day pretty and extra like space on it, which I love. My only qualm with it is that it is easy. Yeah, uh, I've, and that's I mean, what I've like, noticed. None of the Kingdom Hearts games are like notoriously difficult, uh, even if you play on critical mode on like the extended ones. But th- this one, I mean, like one of the things they added was the Koopo coin. Uh, which is a little, like, token you can buy. And when you have it in your inventory, if you would die, instead, you expend the coin and you save yourself. Very, like, much of you play God of War, there's a crystal that you can get and pay a bunch of money for. But even then, money is so cheap in the game, you should always just buy one. So yeah. I have only, I think, legit lost, like, once or twice in the whole game. Because mm-hmm. I have the coin. I'm never going to lose. Uh, so, yeah, that's my only, like, little thing. And it's, yeah, it's, and it's not even that big. Um, only The last thing that I was, like... So, with the Unreal Engine and all that, uh, for one, the, the the screen doesn't fit my screen. I was like, "What? My screen you is might apparently... have a setting wrong." Uh, either like everything else works fine on my PS4. Uh, no, you, you definitely have like you, you should like try like your uh, you should see if your aspect ratio on your TV is set to like custom or to change based on the game. Because if it's not set to like fixed or like a specific one. Mm-hmm. That's why I might be doing that because I I have not seen it on a single game, uh, on a single like screen, not be full screen. I was really weirded out by that. I was like, this doesn't fit in my whole screen. What is happening? You um, can also change that in the back end. Like it, it might have misjudged the the aspect, like the the width of your screen. Maybe um, that's a that's a common PS4 thing, and like it's a common like this gen of game thing. It normally has a little size box at the beginning. Kingdom Hearts doesn't do the size box, it just tries to detect what you have. Okay, and uh, it looks beautiful for the most part, like, everything looks really good. Um, and the cutscenes are phenomenal. Like, are they look dumb great. pretty, it's not they, okay. They look great. Uh, my only qualm is that some of the Disney characters, well, I've only come across Hercules, obviously, so Hercules looks weird with this new engine. And the reason why is because everything smoothed out to a point where like his chest and armor plate and his his arms are just like a single smooth object (laughs) they have like no no texture to them whatsoever and they're just like one color it's like what (laughs) yeah it's because everything has to adhere to its like design style from its movie so it's cool because hercules looks a little weird but by the time you get to like the the other levels the ones that are like the actual cg yeah, movies well, is yeah like perfect. tangled like tangled yeah. and uh frozen and big hero 6 i expect to look incredible because they fit the 3d model very well but like i just felt like i was like they couldn't have like put some texture on his body armor <laughs> or something but uh I, we will do like a full like spoiler yeah, yeah like, t- discussion when the time comes for what you what do you think of the probably... song oh i the love it song. Uh, okay, so you love the intro song. And uh, I, I really, really like it. And that, I I have about five versions of it that popped up on my uh, new releases from all the different artists, artists I follow. And it's of the course. first time ever where no cover is even remotely as good because Utada Hikaru is too good. Yeah, she's she's great. Um, it did take me a minute to get used to because of the uh, the switch to the more like dubstep style. Yeah, I, I um, like it though. And it, it's it, it, yeah, the works. intro, it's, it, it is so well cut together. It's very cool. Um, it's very pretty. But we're not going to talk any more Kingdom no. Hearts. Okay. Uh, it's going to make me want to cut the podcast and go play. Uh, <laughs> oh, go ahead, Scott. What is something you've been enjoying lately? Uh, so as far as my new stand, uh, you know, Kingdom Hearts, of course, is out. Um, my my biggest thing, and this is going to be surprising to uh, anybody who's followed us for a minute or knows my general taste in games. Uh, I'm going to give a really big shout out to Apex Legends. Uh, Apex Legends is a brand new Battle Royale game. That just came out this week. It was kind of a stealth release. It was super unexpected. Uh, made by Respawn Entertainment, the same guys that make uh, Titanfall. And it is, in fact, set in the Titanfall universe. And it's really cool. It's free to play. It has a decent monetization. Like, the monetization is just in the background. You earn loot crates to unlock stuff, so it has progression built in. You feel good as you're playing. And it's all squads. So it's all, like, three-player squads going through and i really don't like I, I haven't liked any battle royale game a lot yet and this one i actually i i kept it i added it to a folder 
in my uh, on my PlayStation, which I only do if I'm going to keep the game for a while. And I played for like four hours last night. I got into the top two, and I was super excited. That's awesome. Uh, yeah, I was like, fucking right. Uh, we got jumped, though. We uh, we we got outplayed. A bunch of guys had sniper rifles up on a hill. We had the low ground. It was not a good situation. It's um, over, Anakin. I have the high ground. <laughs> that's exactly what happened. So that's my biggest shout-out for this week. Is I, I, I really like the game. Uh, if you're looking for a cool like free-to-play shooter, uh, the only other thing that's cool and out this week is that Monster Hunter World currently has its Witcher... Uh, crossover event running where you literally get to play as Geralt of Rivia in Monster Hunter. You get to do an entire like hour or something long mission as Geralt, which is pretty cool. That is cool. Um yeah. other than that, uh like a lot of my favorite YouTubers have been really they've been doing interesting stuff. So one thing for example, um, I'll, I'll speed it up. Uh, for one thing, uh, there's a there's a YouTube channel called Philosophy Tube, and I don't think I've mentioned it on this channel before. Um, he originally like he was just a guy that would stand in front of a bookshelf and talk about philosophy of certain t- things. Not like not like Wisecrack does, where they do mm-hmm. like di- media dissections, more of just like here's a philosophical concept, and I'm going to teach it to you, kind of thing. Gotcha. Now. Because he's an actor, um, and that's what he really loves to do, he's he's shifted so far into now including a real aesthetic element to his work that I really find amazing because people that do YouTube a lot and do these kind of just like, I'm going to talk to the camera about certain things, they don't care about aesthetics, and it's boring. But it's really cool to see some YouTubers progress into this realm of like actual creative thinking where this guy basically took an episode surrounded around the concept of Steve Bannon um, and turned it into, like, a play where he plays all the characters and it's this really interesting thing where it, like, cuts back and forth. Uh, It reminds me of H. Bomber Guy's, like, serious lore analysis on on, um, CAD. He does a really good one on that where it's a very surreal styled video where like it's cutting back and forth between these different things. And then at the end, they kind of like come together into this narrative. It's really impressive to see YouTubers doing this. So that sounds nifty. big shout out to Philosophy Tube and H Bomber Guy and also ContraPoints, who has always been aesthetically minded and continues to get even better as as the as time goes on. Uh, it's really cool to see like it's been making me think like. How can I use what I love, which is filmmaking, and and wind it into the work I'm doing? Um, obviously, right now, I'm just kind of doing narration under footage and motion graphics, something I'm fairly decent at. But eventually, I think I can work in my skills um, of actual filmmaking into into like some sort of narrative structure of these videos. And I think like looking at that, I, I'm really inspired. So yeah. big shout out to that. Well, uh, with that, I think it is uh, time to get some breakfast, guys. What about breakfast? I'm hungry as shit. Let's go. So Aaron, what's for breakfast today? Today we are talking potatoes. Now, there's only one real question when it comes to potatoes for breakfast. Mm-hmm. Do you get the breakfast potatoes or do you get the hash browns Mm, that's rough so scott that is the question i'm posing to you and give your reasons okay so all in all i normally go with hash browns but i prefer breakfast potatoes follow me so the reason i normally get hash browns is because more more often than not you will find hash browns at places like McDonald's or Dunkin' Donuts or like all these places, uh, Wawa, and they're cheap and they're quick to eat on the go because a lot of them make them into like a little hand-sized pockets and stuff. And that's why I normally get those because they're easier and they're quicker to like eat. And I rarely sit down and eat breakfast. I, I it's pretty rare that I get to go, like go to a diner. Or, um, like, at somebody's house and having breakfast and sitting down. Especially when you're at somebody's house, nobody's making breakfast potatoes or hash browns. They're making, like, bacon eggs. You haven't come to our house, sir. All right, you're the, like, only one. You're a freak. Uh, 
So good. So like uh, I I but when I go to like a breakfast bar or a diner and they have that option, I will normally get breakfast potatoes because I found that I discovered them just a few years ago because I didn't grow up having them, and they're awesome. They taste real good. They go real good with all your stuff as long as you're not getting a bunch of other carbs. They're perfect. Yeah, I am gonna go with Scott's answer as well. I'm huge into breakfast potatoes. Hash browns, like, and it's weird because I have every reason to love hash browns Mm -hmm. because they're more related to fries than they are to, like, any other potato Yeah, they're like giant tater tots. Yeah, well, in that case, I can see why I don't like them as much because, like, tater tots to me are just, like, whatever. Fries are better than tater tots. There is no question in my mind. That's true. Sonic, get on the bandwagon. are great. No, I'm not even into that. I hate you. Well, like, have you ever had cheesy fries? It doesn't. If you put cheese on them, it just makes whatever you know, better. You got so me. I'm back fries here. is still better. Back yeah, fries. fries are still better. It's like a ever growing competition. Man, it's like what if we put cheese on these tots? And it's like, well, we actually did that with fries, and they're really good. Like, damn it, man. Now I just want cheese um, fries. Yeah. Oh, Chili's has the most amazing. Oh man, I loaded I fries. I can't wait till payday. I'm gonna go buy all the cheese fries. <laughs> go, I'm gonna go to Chili's. <laughs> uh, I'm I'm putting that out there. That is Aaron Roman saying that cheesy fries at Chili's are the best cheesy fries. You're wrong. The reason being is because they use actual shredded cheese and not that bullshit nacho cheese. Get that the fuck out. You're wrong. Uh, you go to Philly, you find some place that makes some banging mega fries. There's a lot in like. What are they using that cheese whiz Hell they put on yeah. that? Oh no! Get the same cheese whiz you put on your cheese Ruined steak. It. And you also, so the best cheese fries are mega fries. So that's all we had to say about breakfast potatoes. There's not a lot going No, no, no. I'm going back no, we're to done breakfast with it. potatoes. We're just talking cheese fries No, right I'm not, <laughs> we're not talking cheese fries. Mega you fries. don't eat cheese fries for breakfast unless you you're sad. You wake up in the morning, you get some mega fries, you get some buffalo mega fries, which are even better. It's the saddest thing I've ever heard of. It, it's um, cheese fries with cheese oh, whiz no. and then like normally some, some mozzarella on top of that with the bacon bits. And the, sometimes, if you find buffalo fries, they put buffalo sauce with a little bit of, like, buffalo chicken in it. It's amazing. Is is Philly okay? No. Are you guys okay over there? Like, uh, what is with your obsession with cheese whiz? It, it really, it's scaring it's me, delicious. Scott. delicious. I'm imagining El, every Philadelphia resident having a can of cheese whiz just in their pantry, like, yeah. oh, we're ready. We, we, we keep like, it. it. It goes in the, uh, the doomsday supply, like... You're the you're the character from a goofy movie. You remember <laughs> you remember tower the one. Of cheese the yeah. one voiced by so Paulie Shaw. Movie- yeah, oh god. <laughs> uh, yeah, I forgot about that. Um going back to breakfast potatoes though. Um oh, potatoes like, and molasses. They have to be they have to be cut to a perfect size because it's got to cook all the way through and be crispy on the outside and perfect on the inside. It's like the hardest thing to do. Mm-hmm. Um, and the obvious next thing is seasoning. Like, they're not breakfast potatoes if they aren't seasoned heavily. Yep. With, like, fucking a shit ton of salt, pepper, and I've heard it's paprika that's normally used. Mm-hmm. But, like, also giving it a little bit of cayenne or, like, a little bit of kick also really makes it good. Um, but paprika, if if all else fails. Yep. Uh, and yeah, I'm just I'm way more into breakfast potatoes. I don't know why specifically, because um, I have every reason to love hash browns. They're they're thin and crunchy, like it sounds like the perfect thing. But I'm just so into breakfast potatoes. I I do enjoy them. It's one of those things I I've realized long ago that for some reason I cannot cook any kind of potato that belongs in breakfast. I once tried to make potato pancakes and embarrassed myself. Um, I, I just did that. Uh, so I made some latkes. They were delicious. Uh, but yeah, I, I, the potatoes are, are a, an immensely satisfying breakfast-like substance that I, I feel gets off. It. Like, break, potatoes are good always. You find me bad yeah. potatoes, and I'll tell you you're wrong. <laughs> you know what's weird is that, uh, like, early America didn't eat potatoes for breakfast very often. Mm-hmm. The The concept of... What is what is my dog sniffing at up on my desk? Like, there's nothing here. Um, th- so I was actually just reading about this guy because I'm reading about like consumer culture and stuff like that. And it was about this the guy that's considered the the father of propaganda. 
Uh, and it was talking about how when he was working for the bacon industry, um, he, like, because people didn't eat that much for breakfast, they, like, ate some coffee, orange juice, and, like, a little bit of toast. <laughs> um, he, like, called a bunch of doctors, told that doctor to get every other doctor on board that he could about needing to eat more in the morning. Starting your day which is, with which a is, balanced breakfast. Yeah. yeah, exactly. But a bigger breakfast, mm-hmm. like having more substance. And it was it was backed up like by those doctors. Like he didn't convince them to say this was true when it wasn't. Like they agree, but like he made sure like that was how he pushed having more food on the table, therefore making the bacon industry more profitable. That's crazy. Isn't that weird? Like in a world today where like bacon is the most obsessed of over breakfast food in the world, like it needed that push mm-hmm. is is interesting. Yeah. Uh, so anyways, so like I'd imagine breakfast potato it was fall kind of in that same category. It's like there's even with like a ton of bacon and like eggs, there's nothing quite as filling and gives you all those carbs as quickly as some as some potatoes. Yeah. Which is funny because like. When I think about it, I, I don't know too many people that do still sit down and have a full breakfast. It's pretty rare. I do. Um, it is a, like, not during the week, but it is a tradition for Nina and I to once a week go out and get breakfast somewhere. Lame. Um, we have, we have like, a couple of hot spots we really like, but overall, like, we it's our tradition to go out every one, once a week to get some good breakfast because there's nothing quite like just sitting down with a cup of coffee and your breakfast and just like enjoying that without having to feel like you need to do a bunch of shit. Gross. You guys are gross. You're a gross couple people. Gross. <laughs> we are we are a loving couple. And you're gross. Uh, do you have anything to close out on uh, potatoes for breakfast? For breakfast? <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's a lot of potato stuff we can talk about on this channel, but maybe for another day all right well so scott and i are both uh are both breakfast potato fans let us know what you guys think hash browns are breakfast potatoes scott put a poll up on twitter <laughs> twitter poll activate I, I i don't know if, if i didn't figure out how to do it i'm sorry but you can just say it but i'll, I'll try um, you can do it i scott. think I right now i'm not hitting keys on the keyboard i'm just tapping on my desk in like bad morse code that's not how that works. Main event! <laughs> so, uh, this week on the main event, uh, as I am currently in the midst of a strange uh, change in lifestyle uh, altogether, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm about to be moving down to, to, to the Florida and, you know, going to be switching over to working on Roman Bear and the stream and all that stuff just full time. It, it has me thinking, a little bit of just curiosity creeping up on me, and I was thinking about, you know, all the jobs that we've had over the years, all the places you work, and, you know, how much of it is useful. Like, in how many of these places where, like, sometimes you're there just because you, you need a paycheck. And, you know, how many of these places did you learn a skill or acquire a thing or develop as a person and, like, good bad otherwise first jobs last jobs all that stuff so uh that's what we're talking about we're talking about our job histories kind of like a a very bad overlook at our resumes uh but gonna date back to like childhood uh and and stuff you know paperwork like paper roots chores all that stuff oh man so aaron i guess that's my first thing uh what's the first job you had like the first thing that wasn't like a chore where you got like an allowance growing up what's the first time you like went somewhere and like work for it, even if it's like a family if I just friend or made something money. and got paid to do it okay so yeah i didn't have chores growing up in terms of like an allowance by chores kind of set up i they just didn't give me money <laughs> um i couldn't <laughs> be trusted with it it's fine i understand um yeah i, I was the same way it was like i i kept my room clean took care of dog did good in school and then like if I need something. Oh, I'm not can... saying that I kept my room clean. Um, <laughs> that's part of the reason they also probably. No, didn't I didn't either. I, I've, I have a little so brother So my first for that. actual job was self-employment. And I, for a whole summer, had a snow, co- uh, a, um, a shaved ice business. 
So mm-hmm. I don't know. Most Americans might not know what good shaved ice is. This might be hard to explain. Um, those snow cones you get are bullshit, and they're the worst things ever. The flavors are watered down. The ice is too thick, so it doesn't even penetrate. It's just bull crap. It's just you're just eating ice. You're getting knocked off, <laughs> is what I'm saying. In Japan, shaved ice is literally what it sounds like. So I got a hand cranked. Basically, you get this little hand cranked mechanism that has a razor on the end, mm-hmm. and, a, and you freeze water in little like containers and put them in the in the thing, and you hand crank it and shave it all the way down into these tiny little snow shavings. It really is like snow. It's as fluffy and as wonderful yep. as like actual snow. And like we spent, we froze like 10 or 11 of those. Uh, and we hand cranked mm-hmm. all 10 or 11 like in the afternoon, my mom and I. And we packed a, a cooler full of them. So we just had a cooler yep. full of the shaved ice. And I'd put it on the back of a little red wagon with all my cups mm-hmm. because there were supply shops in Japan with like all the stuff for it. And like six or seven different flavors. I had, I had a good flavor selection. Um, and that syrup is fucking amazing over in Japan. It's just, you get a milk carton basically of, of syrup flavoring. It's That's so cool. good. Oh my God. You just put it in the little squeezy yeah. bottles. I don't know what down. they're doing over here in America with their crap flavors. Like I don't you you know, have fond memories of getting a snow cone and just being like here's the cherry flavor and you're like this doesn't taste like fucking cherry. So I it's funny because I I didn't really I, like I would get the snow cone like ice cream thing on occasion from the, the snow truck which is just a hunk of ice with a bunch of yeah. different syrup in it. Um, but uh, I didn't really get shaved ice for the first time until I was here in New York because there are a bunch of places that are actual like yeah. Japanese places that mm-hmm. serve them. And yeah. they're really good. I was really successful for that summer. That was my first official job. This fucking kid, though, don't mm-hmm. know if it was specifically because of me, but he started a counter business where he just sold frozen fucking lemonade. He just ah. walked around and he was like, frozen lemonade, and people ate that shit up. I'm like, you son of a bitch. I spent all afternoon cranking this fucking ice out, and all you did was put lemonade in a styrofoam cup and put it in the freezer? Yep. Yeah, that's business for you. Fucking work smarter, sons not of bitches. harder. <laughs> yeah, that's anybody that tells me oh, that man. a meritocracy is a real thing. That's my story for them. <laughs> so uh, for me, I, I guess my first jobs would be uh, the first one I really remember is because like I've done like little odds and ends things where I'd be like I'd have to like go shovel snow for neighbors and all that stuff. Uh, pretty common like American things, and then like sometimes they toss me like ten bucks. But the first, like, real job that I had is my mom's friend uh, ran a little... There was, like, a a concert series in uh, one of the parks uh, in Mm -hmm. Philadelphia. And I... She would do, like, water ice and, like, hot dogs and all this stuff. And a couple times throughout the one summer, I went and I worked there and I would just, like... I got paid like a couple dollars and then I got a, like a, a fraction of the tips and I would di- I did that and it was the first job I had. It was it was weird because like it was that first time where I was like two hours in and like nobody was there anymore. And I'm like, I'm bored. I want to go home. And I was like, oh, I can't. I have to stay here. Despite there being no one in the park but us. Why? <laughs> and it was uh, it was Scott a weird gained moment. self-consciousness. <laughs> yes. Uh, it, it, it's, it was that, that strange moment of me being like, oh shit, like this is work. You have to stay here cause you're told, like you agreed to do it for X amount of time for X amount of money. Therefore you must Damn. stay. <laughs> so yeah, it, it, it was fun. I, I had a lot of fun. I made a bunch of money. Uh, I, I think I only did it like twice. Uh, and that, cause you know, I had no work ethic. I was just like, oh no, I have my money. I don't need you right now. When I need money again, I'll come back. I will, I will come back when I am in need of money. Yes, when I need the cash, I, I will return. I think there was a you. point in jobs, a um, uh, point in time where jobs actually worked like that. <laughs> yeah. Um, weird, weird world that it is. So yeah, that that was kind of like my first job. Um, going on uh, after like as far as like other like jobs. So like 
That was our first kind of like memory yeah, working. Like, uh, what what was your uh, first yeah. actual job was a summer job. Uh, like once you turned 16 on my base was when you were legally allowed to work for for um, cool. the company under like a summer program. Um, so All right. I and what did you I do worked there? for the gym, which I would go on to actually do mm. full time later when I was on the base. Um, so here's what I learned about summer job opportunities. They find all the shit that they have neglected up until the summer, or in our case, for like the last 20 years, and have us do everything <laughs> that involves that. Like, the, our boss's main purpose for us was to fill in whatever gaps he legally could get away with. He's like, what hasn't That's been done great. for 20 years? Oh, I need you to go rewrap the pull-up bars. And I'm like, okay, that sounds easy enough. He's like, just take off the tape that's on there. Uh, I like On pull-up bars, they put, like, tape that makes your grip, uh, like, you can grip it a little easier. Grip, grip tape. Well, not, like, actual grip. It's just, <laughs> yeah. So, on the, we go outside to the pull-up bars. There are, like, 18 layers of tape that have over the time become one with the bar and i'm just sitting there for at least five hours scraping away at this tape because it is like crumbling off and i have to like pull it off it was the worst and my allergies were going because of all the dust that was trapped in there and whatever molds and fungi just raining down on me and i'm dying and i'm taking off this tape that was a whole day's worth of work and like he literally, if we if we came into the main front office area and sat down, he'd be like, well, I can't have that. What else have we got? Oh, clean all the gym equipment. By the way, the gym had janitors. <laughs> we were just in between temp janitors. And I, I don't, I didn't realize how big of a, how big of an issue pubic hair on gym equipment is. Um, there's a lot oh, of pubic gross. hair on gym equipment, and I'm just like, this is not something I expected to, to find while cleaning. How did this get here? Loose gym shorts. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. Too much, too much of that. And, uh, I wouldn't get into the more, like, when I actually worked for the gym later on, I would, my, my shift was started at 3.30 in the morning. Uh, and mm -hmm. there was another really weird problem I didn't expect. It's a cockroach graveyard awaited me every morning. They would come, yeah, every they morning? would come out in the time between when we closed at 11 p.m. Uh -huh. and opened at 3.30 in the morning, and they would just die. <laughs> Their whole life, they partied too hard and just passed out. Um and we had to clean them all up. And there was a lot of fun. And in Japan, they're, they're big. They're fucking big. They're big-ass cockroaches. And they fly. Oh, yeah. Those are the worst. So sometimes, you get sometimes you would poke awesome. at it and it would go. <laughs> like, have you ever seen the movie Arachnophobia where the trash <laughs> like jumps on yep. the guy? Uh, that's that's I, the experience. <laughs> so Because, like, I'm in New York and, like, Anytime work happens in the apartment, like, or the buildings, and, like, there's a, a vacant lot beside us, so, like, it's worse. They've been, like, re renovating the entire apartment and cleaning out the underneath of the building. Oh, no. So, like, anything that lived down there is trying to scurry up. So, every now and then, we get, like, one or two in the house, and, like, we normally keep stuff down for it just to be safe. Yeah. But uh, we had run out. We didn't have any. And I had one come was in the kitchen at one in the morning and I like I had just walked in and it flew at me and I, I it was like ninja reflex time where I just like hit it and smashed it into the wall with one like motion and it was just gross because I just had it like smeared against the wall in my hand. I was like, what have I done? It makes you realize you no know, with all of our years of evolution, like how dumb our brains still are when fear comes into play. Yep. It's like yeah, my body didn't think about this part, did it? Yep. <laughs> oh, no. Close. Yeah. Oh, man. Uh, see, and that, it's funny, because, uh, like, my first real job wasn't until actually after we were done college. Um, oh. Because, so, 
my parents think, uh, like, my parents both came from, like, lesser educated families. Uh, like, none of my aunts or uncles finished college, to my knowledge. Mm-hmm. Um, so my parents, that was always their thing. It was always something they were really focused on, was, like, they wanted me to go to college and be, like, the first one of us to really do so. So that's what I had to focus on, was school. And so that's what I did. I focused, I did schoolwork. I was, like, a top student. Like, I, I, had, I had a very high GPA when I graduated, all that nonsense. I went to college, uh, finished college, did, like, had a really high GPA when we got out of there. Like, we, we actually did really well in school, like, for, like, the style of school we had. Like, we managed one of the two thesis projects we got. Uh, and when I got out, I, I was, we were supposed to do the whole New York thing, and stuff was a little rough at home, so I, I stayed and since I was staying, I was like, I need a job. I need to help. Uh, and, like, I couldn't just stay home all the time. Like, my loans were coming as well. So I got the job at GameStop. Because, like, where else does a nerd want to work? And it's funny, because I think I, I learned a lot of, like, my work ethic over the time I was there. Which is weird. And it also kind of slowly over time helped me, like... I, I think for me, it was, it was oddly useful. Because it was my first step in bringing down my ego that had gotten huge from years of just like school being a breeze and like getting the projects I wanted and doing really well, Mm -hmm. uh, like in college and high school and my ego had just kind of gotten inflated. But at the same time I was still gaining the confidence to like talk to people and like realize like, Oh, people enjoy like talking to me and they like, I, I I'm relatively good at like, expressing what I want to say and like in a manner that convinces the person you know yeah uh and being at GameStop definitely helped me with that you know need having these like weird little goals that I had to reach and uh my first boss was a guy named Mac who was had super crazy like really bad OCD like everything in the store every section had to be set up the correct way the, the exact same way everything had to be in the same format and if it wasn't especially if it was, like, something that, like, was clearly an accident. He wouldn't get mad at anybody, but, like, he had to fix it. Mm-hmm. And he taught me how to do it, like, his way and how to do it all that way. And this really, like, prim and proper and, like, have everything in its position, have everything in its order, get everything running, like, uh, uh, in uniform with each other. And get everything to play nice to each other. The way he, like, taught his staff to, like, work together as a staff and all that. I was like, oh, man, all of these things are really good. And I've taken a lot of that with me throughout the years of, like... I'm working, I work this way, I get these things done this way, and, you know, being super personable and likable without, like, and being able to sell something without just being a jerk, like, my my way to sell things has always been, like, hey, this is why I like it, and this is, like, what I, I know about it, mm-hmm. what do you like, <laughs> you know, like, it's just what talk to people, like? treat people like people, and, and I, that's how I've continued to try and do things, so, uh, that, that was a huge thing, I worked at GameStop for... From 2012 when we got out until 2015 when I moved up here. Or 20, 2016 when I moved up here. Yeah. Uh, something I think that's right. Uh, so that, that, was, that was a good stretch of time. Uh, I worked at two different stores. Uh, I was uh, an ASM for a short while. Uh, assistant manager, in case anybody doesn't know what that means. Like, I, I was key holder within like a month and a half. And stuff. And it was really cool. It was fun. Uh not a great place to work unless you have a really good manager because the manager is the one who actually keeps you know things from coming down on you uh, yeah. if your manager is weak-willed and sucks and doesn't understand that like at the end of the day what matters is your store is enjoyed by people and makes a good profit yeah uh, and instead toes the company line they're wrong yes uh i think with my time like my first actual job i realized that hierarchies in employment are not set up on a system that's based on skill or merit. Um, I have found many bosses to be worse than I was at things. And that's not saying like, I'm not trying to stroke my own ego here, but like it, some of them were just like incompetent at times. And I was like, what is happening? And there were times where they didn't stand up for me. And I realized how shitty it was to have that situation. Mm-hmm. Having a boss that stands up for you is really important. It, it really makes a difference. It's, it's a difference between having a boss and a leader. Yes. Because some bosses will make all of their problems your problems. 
it's like just the cycle that they're used to like comes through them like if they get the shit kicked out of them in a meeting or something and then come bring it to you it's like why because they think that's how management works they think that's how this all works and like it takes a special kind of person to sit back and realize that these people are beneath you Mm -hmm. (laughs) they're your team and like they don't deserve that it shouldn't come to them. Definitely. So I guess like, now I'm curious, like, uh, n- okay. not naming names if you don't want to, but, uh, okay. No, I, I got some. Yeah. Examples. I was just going to ask um, like, what is like the best boss that you've had? And what's the worst one you can think of is the best boss. Best me. Boss. Wow. <laughs> no, you sure. You're, you're probably near the worst. <laughs> I fed you mozzarella sticks. <laughs> Stop telling me this isn't in budget. When is it in, budget? in budget? The mozzarella sticks were in budget. Yeah, I paid for them. Anyways. <laughs> Anyways. Um, I don't know if I can define a, a worst boss or a best boss. Well, like, boss. are there, like, ones that, like, um, like for you personally, like, worst boss or best boss that yeah, you Yeah, yeah. Um, so, oh, this is really hard. Um, just as an example for a, a bad-er boss, not, like, the worst, but just Nina. not great. <laughs> no. Um... <laughs> Will murder I know, but it's um, fun. Uh, this gentleman, I'll call him Frederick. That's clearly not his name. Um, he, so, Frederick was our boss at the gym. Mm-hmm. He was a he's a small Filipino man, mm-hmm. and I could not understand what he was saying ever. Yeah, lack of communication and is this immediately bad. Um, and this isn't like. I don't mean that he was just bad at, uh, like, conveying his points. I mean, he just didn't have English down the best. Mm -hmm. And so this is my impersonation of that boss, and it is not in uh, an ill manner. It just tickled me the way he talked because it was adorable. He had a very high voice like this, and he thought it was... And you kind of catch the last word he said, and then you you know, and it's just how he talked. (laughs) Like, that was seriously, like, I would get the first word and the last word and have to put two and two together. Like, okay, I think I can make this work. And then the last word was weights? (laughs) Clean the weights. You got it. Oh, there's a lot of pubic hair here. (laughs) Um, So, he, in a situation that saw me kind of get, like, I was definitely in the right. Um, I am absolutely sure of this. Uh, we started doing 100% ID checks. Mm-hmm. Like, this was just something that the base was rolling out, like, at all their facilities. Uh, it wasn't something that everybody was used to yet, but they were very strict about us doing yeah. it. If you, if you walked into the gym and you weren't wearing a uniform, I'm checking your ID. Mm-hmm. So, one day, the sergeant major of the base walks in. Now, the sergeant major is a really big component on the base like there's the co the xo and there's officers in between but like the sergeant major is like the next pillar for dealing with the enlisted side yep uh in terms of like the hierarchy of the base um so this is the sergeant major of the entire base he walks in he's a cocky motherfucker he was an asshole Mm -hmm. um and he knew me yep uh, as most people did. Um, his son was in my JROTC group, and he was also a shithead. Uh, by the way, his name was... I'm going to say it because it's the most rich person arrogant name ever. Remington Wimberly. <laughs> That's so bad. You could not have a more 80s villain name. No, you could not. <laughs> 80s ski <laughs> skiing movie villain name. <laughs> so... Uh, anyway, so he walks in and he, you know, I do, I do the right thing and I say, sir, I need to see your ID. And he pulls the line that we all know and love. Do you know who I am? Yeah. Um, I need your ID. Yes, sir. I know who you are. You're the sergeant major of the base. Are you sure you know who I am? And he pulled this whole power trip and got really upset about yep. it. 
and as many do, ask to see my manager. But my manager was the one that came. Yep. And told me that I was in the wrong and I was doing the wrong thing. Like, are you are you shitting me right now? After that, they put out a whole memo yep. about letting him and the CEO and the XO through facilities without ID checks. So that was my first taste of uh, power structures. Yep. Welcome to the real world, as they say. My least favorite line. Yep. Um, so yeah, that that sucked. Yeah, that, that, that is definitely a, like well. a shitty boss. Um, yeah, no, I, I always you? I always hated stuff like that. Um, so I I think my like some of my worst bosses I had like uh, as far as like best ones, it's kind of a tie between actually two of my GameStop managers. Um, one was Mac because like Mac, while like. Like, he taught me a bunch of, like, how to do things, and I think he was a very good, like, super hands-on, like, technical manager. He was a little too controlling, like, he had to have, like, do too many of the things, because he was, like, Mm -hmm. super OCD about it. But the other was, uh, if he hears this, it will go to his head and his ego will explode. But my buddy Ron. Ron was the type of, like, he was lazy, and he was kind of, like, super slack, like, he was a slacker, like, to no end. But... For the most part, Ron normally had our backs on things, uh, and as long as, like, I could make an argument for it, or I could, like, be like, hey, this is how I'm doing this, this is what I do, these are all the things that I did, here's why, he would be like, okay, like, I, you know, just keep doing that, like, as long as it keeps working, like, I'm, you're fine, like, I'll, I'll make, I'll tell them that, and they won't bother you, like, they'll yell at me, Yeah, and he, he was also, like, a, a genuinely, like, good boss like he actually looked he was one of the few like bosses i've had that like looked out for us on a more personal level on occasion uh like Mm -hmm. when i was having a really bad time at home ron let me uh like stay with him for a while Uh, and i actually rented out a room at his place to like get back on my feet and do well and it was awesome it's actually where i lived up until i moved to new york and it was clutch and he just he had his downsides everybody does but for the most part he made, like, working there livable. And I was a very, like, angry, not happy person in those years. Like, being stuck in Philly, like, barely getting to do film work and all that stuff. And then, like, still being at GameStop and not, like, advancing. Because I, like, I was like, I need more money to get more places. But I'm not getting more because everything's stuck. Um, right. So, like, there's that. But then on the opposite end, and I, I don't even remember this guy's name anymore. But he was my last boss at GameStop. Uh, th- th- this guy and another guy when I got the Best Buy were both the same type of dude where all they cared about was going up the ladder and they failed to yeah. realize that they couldn't go up the ladder unless their whole crew was running efficiently and they weren't going to do it if they didn't care about them. And like, mm-hmm. this is just the, this is like word words of wisdom here. The best I can muster is if you are running a team, a small team under you, the best way to pull out a great performance from them and to really push them isn't necessarily to be their friend. You don't have to be, like, their best buddy. But to make them like you and respect you. Like, do good by them, and they'll do their damnedest to do good by you. And if they don't, that's when you, like, drop the hammer on somebody. You don't do it as soon as, like, you show up places and be like, you're the one that's underperforming. And, like, when you do see somebody, this is a bit of pet peeve of mine at the store I work at now is too often people like places don't give any props to play like people that do well. Um, Mm -hmm. for like, since I've worked at the strat, I'm the best performing member of the RPG department. Nobody will ever notice that. And it's funny because now my boss is starting to, because I'm leaving and he has to replace me and they have to get multiple Mm -hmm. DMS to replace me. Because of, like, I, I do too much work. I do too many things. And they, they need to, like, insert multiple people to handle my workload. And right. these are bosses that didn't expect, like, uh, accept any of the, like, unique things we did. Like, because I don't care. I've been out of GameStop for years. My store that I worked at had, like, a $3 million, like, store. And, like, a, a 35 or 60%. No, it was... The, the best year we had, it was stupid. We had a 70% profit margin. That's really That's good. fucking dumb. Like, that's not, that's not a thing businesses do. And that was our profit margin. It was obscene. 
And it's because we had a unique way of doing this. Like, we understood what kind of store we were. We were a mall store with regulars. You tell me. You find me a store that you regularly visit in the mall, like, at, like on a weekly basis, just to stop it and say hi to the guys at the store, I'll wait. You know, like... If you, if you go to a GameStop or, like, a game store, it's normally, like, the one around the corner from you on the strip mall. No. People will come see me at the store. And, th- like, uh, this new boss that came in didn't care. And then it was the same thing at Best Buy, where all they cared about was volume of things sold. I want you to know, audience, yeah. that as Scott is speaking, his head is slowly filling up the frame. His headphones are expanding to a point I don't think they can handle. They might break. His brand new headphones, yep. guys. It's going to pop. It's all of my Scott rage. Um, so, yeah. It, um, those, like that, my, that's the worst. Is like a boss that only cares about moving up. And like the, the, the absolute worst quality, though, is when you are clearly condescending. I think the, the least favorite thing I ever had happen to me. Yeah. Like, a, a very specific moment, the least favorite thing I ever had happen to me was, I, um, I had a bad day. I woke up late, I barely made it to work, I was, I was brand new in New York, barely scraping by, I've been working 60 plus hours a week, uh, between my two different jobs, and trying to, like, find more jobs, and I had run just a gauntlet that week, and my hair had gotten long, and... I, st- I didn't have the money or the time to go get a haircut. I kind of, I, again, I was already run late and I walked into the, the, I got downstairs and one of the managers ran into me and he was like, what's your hair, man? I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, it's uh, getting long. I was like, yeah. He's like, can't go to work like that. I was like, yeah, yeah, I can. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm about to. And he like, he copped an attitude with me, but he didn't have any leg to stand on. Uh, like, I was like, I don't have the money for it. And he was like, it's like $20. I was like, are you giving it to me? <laughs> Cause yeah, seriously. Uh, and he, I think there's a, yeah, I think there's bosses that clearly don't understand the situations and yeah, the people also, below them. hundred percent. Don't be afraid to stand up to your boss. Cause nine times out of 10 on something like that, they're wrong. And seriously. if they go to corporate, yeah, like, they, they'll get in trouble because they harassed you. So towards the end of my time in Japan, um, so uh, this is this is moving uh, fast forwarding a little bit um, to when I worked for marketing, which was two years ago or wow three years ago now. Um, like it, this was kind of silly, but I kind of had this attitude late in the game of like, what are they gonna do? Fire yep. me? Seriously, like I knew people that were the shittiest workers. They had the worst attitudes. They came in late. Like, they had multiple violations, and it was really hard to fire them. Mm-hmm. And here my bosses were giving me shit for really little things. And my biggest pet peeve when it comes to the bosses I've had is realizing, like, not realizing that I am a human being that operates well with limited uh, supervision. Mm-hmm. Point me in a direction, and I'll do my best. Especially when I was in marketing because that's my field. Yeah. Like, they're like, I, like, I just, it was the whole, like, it's, it, you know, it's just part of working for the government too, is like, you're, it's, it's strict rules. You got to be in at this time and you leave at this time. And it's just like, it got ridiculous. Mm-hmm. It's like, you get two 15 minute breaks a day. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's like, and it became a micromanaging thing. And at one point my boss told me, cause I went to the bathroom after I got back from lunch. Mm-hmm. And he brought us in. He's like, you can't do that anymore. <laughs> like, go to the bathroom? Are you fucking nuts, bro? Like, no, 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 I can. They're like, it's this, like, this, that there's rules on that. Yeah, seriously. Like, if I gotta go, I'm gonna go. Doesn't matter if it's right after lunch. Like, I realized I took my lunch break and I came back and I went to the bathroom. It's because I had to. Because I had just finished my lunch break. <laughs> yeah, like, Ah, that's the kind of thing that drives me crazy. Uh, a l- like restriction of freedoms. I enjoy. I'm a person that operates well when given a lot of leeway in terms of like. I'm the kind of guy that takes the approach of like, is the work getting done? Is it getting done well? I can govern myself, but of course, you know, I'm in a landscape that doesn't really encourage that. Like, unless you're your own boss, like bosses feel like they have to be like yeah. that. 
and they're taught to be like that and that's they continue this cycle of just being the worst yeah it's funny there's um, actually a, a, an episode of uh, adam ruins everything that's all about like workplace myths uh and like yeah yeah it's, it's a, good a very one. good one and, and one of my like the whole thing is is like this boss who's super nice is really cool and he's like all like hip and cool and they have all these fun things in the office and it's like but it's really just a distract from the fact that they're actually being a jerk in these other six places um yeah and also that like they're getting away with not giving you certain benefits and such and exactly such. and yeah you know, like that's the thing that uh, I, I like i try to keep mindful when i work places and for the past few years like i've worked playing make-believe <laughs> so i can't really complain i have a yeah. lot of fun and i i right it's always um, funny whenever because the RPG department at my store because my department my store is actually divided up into departments according to the like major games that that run like the majority of the business so there's like somebody that runs the after school program which is like the kids and then there's like war gaming magic and role playing games which role playing games right. what I fall under and every now and then like we've had like four or five people come through. And the, my first boss is my buddy Ben, and he's the guy who got me in. And Ben was my best boss in the whole program because Ben helped me get games and then left me alone. He was just like, go. If you, if you have problems, if you have, like, an uncomfortable situation, if you lose players, if something goes wrong, update me. He's like, if, if, yeah. if you get a bunch of new players, if a whole bunch of things go good, update me. If everything is at the status quo, don't bother me. That And that's how we operate it. And when I, whenever I get a new boss, and especially my, my current boss, he is so insecure in himself that he often, like, overreaches and, like, is always, like, trying to micromanage me. And I'm like, dude, I've been doing this longer than you've been in this store. Like, I helped yeah. build the foundations for this program. Trust in people yeah. is basically the moral exactly. of the story. Like, a boss should have trust in their people. If they don't, then they're not running a great team. Yeah, like, why did you hire those people? Like, why do you have them in your team if they're not doing their job? Yeah. Anyway, uh, I guess I'm I'm running a little bit behind. Uh, like, so the next 15 minutes, I'll kind of fast forward through my work history, and then we can talk a little bit more about this kind of stuff because it's fun. Um, so after college, Scott said his first real job was, like, after college. So we're, I'm going to follow suit. So after college... I, uh, we, we moved, like, we moved all our stuff to Philadelphia, and then Scott had to stay behind for various reasons, and I went to New York to try and scout things out, because the ultimate plan was to have, um, three roommates, yep. and that didn't work out we well, uh, oh no, um, and yeah, I kind of ended up in this weird position of being in New Jersey, now the thing was, I had, um, I had family there, so I was in a position of uh, of good standing. Like, I had my aunt there and my uncle there. And so, luckily, they had work for me, and I worked for their company, Breathe Better, uh, which cleans out, like, air ducts and, and uh, filtration systems of buildings. Um, it, was, it was great. Uh, and real quick, fun story about my uncle's company, Breathe Better. Mm-hmm. Everybody that worked for him, including my uncle, like smoked a pack a day. I swear. <laughs> um, so the best, the best part of my day was showing up at these people's houses, and they'd go up and they'd knock on the door, and somebody would answer, and they'd they'd say, "Hey, I was going breathe better." <laughs> Where's the? <laughs> it was the, the, the heaviest like Brooklyn accent with this graveled voice. <laughs> Uh, fucking perfect uh, 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 um that was interesting that kind of gave me um i mean it was my first like i not the gym was probably my first but like i there was a, a, a heavier stress on manual labor type stuff because we're running throughout buildings and uh carrying around 40 foot ladders mm-hmm. um and i'm always the one getting up on the ladders and also because i'm small and nobody else was like i'm the one getting behind washers and dryers oh, that and sucks like doing all that kind of stuff like i was that was the life i was living like it was a lot of it was that like manual labor like the working class type life mm-hmm. the kind of life that you see portrayed in the american vision the hard working americans um you know whatever it was okay like i learned a lot about people um especially in New York, like the diversity between classes is insane. I'll be in a a single building 
I go in one apartment. It's beautiful. Like this person just redid it. They blew out a second apartment just to make their uh, a giant one for themselves. And it's all modern and shit. And the guy next door is like some like 60 year old woman who presumably has, has cats because there is a litter box with shit piled up waist high. But I, I didn't see the cat. Yep. I think it might be dead. Which- Buried in its own feces. Oh, <laughs> um, and like hoarding to the max, just the most disgusting apartments I've ever seen in my life. Gross. Awful. It was the, oh, it was so gross, like watching where I had to step in a, an apartment. That's bad. And like navigating through giant stacks of newspapers and shit. Uh, so that was that. After that, I got a job. Or not a job, more like a training for a job with the FAA. I was training to be an air traffic controller because they hired, like, uh, was it Reagan? God, I'm going to mess this up. I believe it was Reagan who, when the air traffic controllers went on strike, he basically fired them all. (laughs) So everybody that was an air traffic controller was hired at the same time, which means a large portion of them are retiring at the exact same time. So now they had this, like, we got to hire all these people. (laughs) So they made it open to the public, which was not the case before. Like, you had to go to an air traffic control school or be former military, like, doing the same occupation. Uh, And this one, they were just, like, open to the public. You apply doing all this, like, you take a bunch of tests, uh, like, aptitude tests, psychological tests, all this shit. Like, it was a couple of, like, five months worth of stuff I had to do just to, like, even be considered for acceptance. And I, along with, like, 1,500 other people were accepted. Which was crazy, because there was like, um, like, eighteen thousand people applied. I think. Yeah, that, that's a pretty uh, small fraction. It was it was crazy, and like I, I'm still blown away that they saw that I had this aptitude. Unfortunately, I failed the course. Um, it's a pass or fail thing. Like you, like you build up to thirty three percent of your grade, and then on the last two days you take three simulations that are worth 64 percent of your grade mm-hmm. or or six, 60 67 percent of your grade uh and i just unfortunately missed by like one point oh that sucks so if i had passed that i would have been in alaska right now <laughs> working as an air traffic controller and presumably would have been on strike um because of the government <laughs> shutdown that just happened uh I would have been dead, is what I'm saying. I would have been frozen out in the snow, like, trying to catch a moose or have something. Have you seen the thing? Uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, after that, a little bummed out, I kind of returned to Japan with my tail between my legs, to my family, uh, just feeling like an absolute failure in life. Like, this is the one thing that, like, everybody does. They work and have a job and, like, get paid, and I wasn't. Like, once you fail, you're done. There's no uh, restart. So I went back to Jap- Nobody's yeah, ever come I went to back Japan. from that. Yeah, because in New York, I had a really hard time finding job outside of my uncle's company because I was looking actively mm-hmm. uh, and just not getting anything. I even applied to gyms. I have a lot of work experience working at a gym, and I could not find a job as a like basic lowest level employee at a fucking gym. It was crazy. Uh, so that's why I returned to Japan because I felt like there would be opportunities there for me because people knew me. Mm-hmm. But even then, I literally got saved at the last minute, like the last day my visa was supposed to expire a friend of the family like actually took it upon themselves to get me hired. That's cool. Because I didn't actively seek out that job. Mm-hmm. I saw, sought out a bunch of jobs. I was going to work as a fucking popcorn shoveler and they wouldn't take me. That's crazy. Um, I could, I, I was crazy. It was a lot because of how their algorithms worked. Mm-hmm. Anyways, long story short, I worked for car rental. I worked for marketing. After that, uh, and I got to do my video stuff for a long time, and that's like the, where the majority of my body of work comes from. And then, after two years, and I met Nina there, and Gross. we just decided, like, fuck it, we're gonna move to Austin, Texas. It was something where she wanted to go, and it seemed like there were job opportunities there, especially in the tech industry. Um, so we did that, and I worked for a furniture company, which is my first ever like actual sales experience. Never again. And that was interesting. That was really, no, I hate sales. I've always hated sales, but I hate it even more. But I did find it interesting because I got to learn about furniture, which is never something I would ever think that I'd have any knowledge of, but now I do. (laughs) I know what a chase is (laughs) and a settee. Uh, And now I work for a contracting company 
that I'm not allowed to say what we do. <laughs> <laughs> and honestly, none of it feels like it's moving me anywhere, uh, which is why I've taken it upon myself to employ myself under this Roman Bear production. Yeah, that's why we make cool shit. As chief manager, I'm the CEO here at Roman Bears, and my co-CEO, Scott, <laughs> and we're making shit happen. And we have to go soon. I'm so sorry. I'm, like, rushing the end of this podcast. Yeah, no, because I, I also have to get ready and, like, do the, the stream. But, uh... Scott, go through your resume. Cool. Go. So, uh, as far as, like, mine, it's at GameStop for, like, many, many years. Uh, then I, I got to uh, work uh, very briefly at AMC Studios. I very briefly worked as a photographer. Like, I, I got hired. I did the training. And then I never did the shifts because I had to... Uh, I, move out of where I was living and would literally no longer be able to get to the photography place. Um, mm -hmm. Then I was at Best Buy in New York and the New York Film Academy. And finally, I, I was at the Strat where I, I work at the Strat and I freelance on the side doing D&D &D games. And throughout all of that, I, I was freelancing as an assistant director uh, in film. Uh, Aaron, do you, do you want to do a, a quick, like, favorite film that you've ever worked on yeah do you have a favorite like film project oh. you've worked on uh i mean like not really i've only pa'd on three different things um while i was in new york this is something i didn't mention uh while i was working for breathe better i was actively trying to get into the film industry and the only way i knew how is to be a production assistant mm. uh, it's like literally like if you work enough hours as a production assistant and pay an enormous fee you can be considered part of the uh director's guild of america mm -hmm. Which is, like, that would be cool, but, like, the amount of hours is insane. Uh, and I realized that you actively have to seek out new jobs, like, every time one ends. Yeah. It's not like a, you get on with a production company and you can just keep moving it's that from freelance puddle grind. hopping. It is crazy, and I did not enjoy that at all. Um, it was cool. I did get to see stuff. I worked, so I worked, this, my biggest experience was at, on an internship month long for the movie The Cobbler, which is an Adam Sandler movie you can see on Netflix. Um, it was like a really small budget, so they weren't paying us. They paid us for like one day of work. Mm -hmm. uh, they gave us like one actual paid day of work. And that gave me a lot of insight, but it also made me really jaded. And I look back on it now and like I have a lot of hate for some of the stuff I did. Uh, but ultimately, I realized that that's just the name of the game. And like the only way to change it is to change the game. So like... If I ever find myself in the position of working on a film, I want to make sure that everybody is treated fairly. Like, having PAs come in every day for a month solid of their life, work for no money, and work, tw like, 18-hour days at the longest is insane to me. Yeah, that's crazy. And I, I hope that never happens to anybody else out there. And especially because they had us doing fucking Firewatch on uh, lunchtime, which, if you don't know, that means you watch the equipment while everybody gets lunch, and then, like, you have the, a shorter lunch period. Mm -hmm. So, like, they're using their unpaid people to watch the equipment while everybody that's getting paid is getting lunch. I'm like, you fuckers. Yep. Uh, it's December in New York. It's freezing. Yeah, man. Uh, my, my, my favorite one that I ever worked on was a, a feature film uh, called uh, Heart of the Beast. It was a little indie thing. It was the first time I got to be uh, an AD. It's actually the only feature I've worked on. I've worked on a lot of short films. I think there's, like, 15 short films I've, I've worked on, something like that. Uh but that, that was the only, like, feature, and it was fun. Uh, I had a blast working with this little crew uh, called C Truly Brave Films. I believe they have split now. They, they each are, like, independent in different fields of film. And the my least favorite one, though, uh, like, Heart, Heart of the Beast was, like, the best way to make a fun indie film with, like, a lo low budget and, like, local crew and a bunch of, like, buddies and some good people that you just found. Then the opposite end was uh, the first couple, one of the worst, like, projects. And it's funny because this project has done really well, so I won't, like, drop the name. It's been in a whole bunch of festivals. Um, it was just, like, weird and awkward working on because uh, I loved, like, a lot of my coworkers and, like, the people in the film and even, like, the, the director. She was awesome. But it was a film that was being produced by five different people, all of whom were in the movie. And it was just super awkward and not cool because they would always kind of like nitpick at each other in the background and kind of like peck and, and argue because they were all executive producers because they had split the budget for the film between them all. And it was just not fun. <laughs> yeah, that doesn't sound so, fun. But uh, um, I'm sure we can do another episode where we dive in all about like 
working in the film industry and what it's like and what it's uh, like. What's fun? What's bad? What's uh, how do you get in? I wish, I wish I could talk more about it. You have a little more like experience actually making things happen, whereas I'm on the other end, like just being asked to do mm-hmm. things. So, um, yeah, we'll definitely talk about that. And there's also something to be said about like the amount of jobs both you and I have worked, like especially I've, I've worked so many. Some of them freelance, some of them not paid, but ultimately, like, it's weird for me to have worked so much in a single span of 20 freaking six years. Mm -hmm. Like, that's a lot of stuff. Like, when most people were used to a world where they, like, find their way into one occupation and then stay with it. You know, and build up a retirement or something. And I but just it's don't funny because I feel like a lot of people uh, like in our age range are kind of in the same way. And honestly, like a lot of people that I that we know about, and I, I can't think of examples because I'm hungry and need to to set up. But yeah, uh, um, I I want to say to everybody out there, uh, like know that you're hustling. Like, don't let people tell you that you're lazy and entitled. Well, if you are lazy and entitled, maybe revisit yourself. But Seriously, take an accurate reflection like Scott and I just did to look at your life and what you've done and like ask yourself, am I really entitled? I would say that I'm not. I've worked a lot and I've worked very hard. Um, know when you can ask for more. Because honestly, it's uh, it's high time we started asking for more as a, as a group of people, like with the work we do. So it's good to take time to reflect on your work uh, like we've do, like we're doing right now. Scott, any last thoughts from you? Um, man, it's just like work hard, find places that you can work that you enjoy and you know, don't be afraid to change. Like don't be afraid to go elsewhere. Like I it was weird. Like when I I took the leap into going to the strat, it was strange because I actually took a pay cut to do that, but ultimately I ended up making a little more money and doing something that I really love and and, and it built me a whole lot of skills that I never thought I could do. Uh, I, I've talked about it before on this, on the show and on the stream, but things like this, like talking and expressing my thoughts and having an audience, I didn't think is something I could ever like handle doing. I thought like I had to be the back behind the like screen person forever. I could never be in, in yeah. front of the camera. And that's what I do now. Like that's what I'm going to be doing. And that's my goal. Like that's what I want to do so much is make cool, fun, like for the most part, positive content with me in it, I guess. Like that's nifty. Yeah. Uh, so some summarizing those, uh, work hard, know you can always ask for more and, um, and don't be afraid to have a change of, uh, environment. Like don't be afraid to pursue opportunities when they're presented. Hell to yeah, you. man. All you got to do is jump. Uh, and that is all yeah. with episode 42 of the, we could have done porn podcast. Uh, as always, I'm Scott joined by Aaron. You guys have a good week. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye.